centers of gay power and life in this country and to be able to have some contribution here. The other side of the question is that it's really sad that I have to do this. I was wondering when is this topic ever going to die? And yet I'm told that <coughs> one of the issues that comes up constantly with people coming out is they're struggling over the Bible. Uh, I will tell you up front, uh, as far as I can tell, as far as any historical research could ever determine, the Bible was absolutely not at all concerned about what we're talking about today. The words might sound the same, but they didn't mean to them what they mean to us. Any of you speak Spanish or French? You know the difference when you try to translate from one language to another? That's what's at stake in this Bible stuff. So I have just a few minutes to do something that we could spend like a six-hour workshop on. But what I want to do is give you an overview. Uh, we're going to look briefly at the texts. I'm going to focus in on Leviticus. It's the Old Testament now called the Jewish Scriptures. Uh, and then we'll look at the text in Romans, in the Christian Scriptures, the New Testament. That is the key text. But I'm not going to do it, I want to do Leviticus, because the sense of it is that Romans is talking about Leviticus. And until you get that first one in place, you don't know what Paul is talking about when he's writing for the Romans. And I'll try to show you how those go together. Uh, let me tell you something about me, just so you know who I am. I was introduced as father. I'm claiming my fatherhood again. In 1995, I wrote official documents to the Vatican resigning from active ministry. In the Catholic Church, once you're ordained, you're always a priest, but you can stop ministering. The Vatican has never responded to my resignation. What do you do when your boss won't accept your resignation? What does that mean? They must want me to continue working for them, so here I am, speaking for the Pope. <laughs> This is me, <laughs> young, pious, I don't look too pious there, but I was. Absolutely bought the whole thing hook, line, and sinker. I mean, uh, 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 this studied in Rome, ordained. Let me look sad there whenever I see that picture. Because I don't know how it looks to you. Uh, that's me being ordained. And, and the movement. I studied theology. I have a doctorate in systematic theology. That means the philosophical aspects about all the beliefs of the world, and especially Catholicism. I studied with a man named Bernard Lonergan, who's put down as probably one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century. And that's the only reason I'm able to stand here. I'm absolutely confident about where I stand. Because his background has let me sort the things out. He spent his whole life studying what it means to think. And what does knowledge mean? And once you get that in place, you know what makes sense and what doesn't. We all know that in ourselves. If somebody gives you a snow job, you know. There's something about, we're geared, you know, to having things hold together. You know if it's a snow job. Even though you don't know the answer, you know this isn't the answer. He studied all that. And because of that, I'm able to do this stuff. So philosopher, it was pretty clear to me that the Catholic Church was not going to change. We all thought that it would. I was in San Antonio in the early 80s. I was actually the representative of the diocese working to the gay and lesbian community. And we thought the Catholic Church was going to open up when John Paul II came in. And he was a great world figure, but he shut the whole church down, the Catholic Church. And I decided that if I was going to survive, I had to get another job. I went to Tech to Austin. I got a doctorate in development, human development. And my work now has been putting psychology and theology together, and what comes out, I think, is spirituality. Uh, these are the this stuff you don't need to. There's a list of my books in here. Any real scholars, that's the scholarly work, university press stuff. This has just come out. It's a popular presentation of my work on spirituality. The book that I noted for the Bible and homosexuality was a hobby. I was trying to get things worked out for myself. And when I got it worked out, I said, somebody ought to publish this and popularize it. All the scholars know what I'm telling you. I suspect even the fundamentalists do, but they don't want to admit it. 
They all know it, but nobody will say it because everybody's so uptight. You saw what happened to the, uh, the Episcopal Church. They ordained Bishop Robinson, an out gay man, and the whole church is split. And so they have to back off. Nobody wants to make too much trouble. I mean, we're in bad times. Uh, but this book, in any case, my work, my whole life work has been putting spirituality together, psychology and theology, and integrating them. So that's that. These two books apply that same issue, this to meditation. If you can explain meditation purely psychologically, what happens to God and other realms and metaphysics? And I, I answer those questions. Uh, this is applying it to Christianity. Can you be a Christian and still be beyond the narrow limits? The subtitle of this should be rooted in the tradition and branching beyond it. And that's specifically Christian. These are the books that we're interested in today. This one on the Bible. I wrote this Bible, if you allow me to say it this way, to get the Bible out of the discussion. The fact is it should not be part of the discussion. The, the, the marriage debate in California, I mean, even apart from what the Bible, even if the Bible was condemning homosexuality, it should not be part of the discussion. We are a, a pluralistic society. No group has the right to impose their religious beliefs on everyone else. And especially when the result is injustice for people. When we, 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 they make it harder for us to support each other and to love one another and to contribute to our society. That is not right. But, uh, so this was a negative thing. Get the thing off the discussion. Uh, and, and, but once you've come out, I have, some of you have had these problems. I, I know, oh, if I only come out, my whole life will be wonderful. Everything will fall in place, and I'll be, that's what was wrong. I was gay, and I didn't know it, and now I am. And, and then you come out, and what? You've got a life to work out just like anybody else. That's not the magic bullet that changes your life. So what do you do once you realize you're okay? That's what this book is about. Gay identity and spiritual growth. What does sex have to do with spirituality? I'll give you a real quick summary of the, my thinking on it. I start talking spirituality not by looking to God. We don't know what God is. God is mystery. God is marvel. God is awe, if, whatever those words might mean, to God. I start down here. There's something in us that's always reaching and wondering and questioning. And the awe that we experience, it's in us. So how can you ever be filled with awe and wonder and gratitude if you're afraid of yourself? If you can't love somebody, if your very affections are things that you back off of? That's the stuff that opens us up and we reach out to other people. I have a really good friend up in Boston, wise, wise uh, woman who does uh, social work. And I was talking with her once about being lonely. And she said to me, thank God whenever you're lonely and horny. Because if it weren't for that, you'd be totally locked up in yourself. And that's a real small world. But if you're afraid of your sexuality, how can you open? That's a simple way of saying what gay identity, any identity has to do with spiritual growth. You have to be comfortable in your own being. And if you are, it just blossoms. When you walk down the street, I, oh, I, I get entranced every time I come to California. It's so hard to go back. I mean, this place is beautiful. The ocean and the trees, these, uh, the, the whole, and you just, you know, it's just marvelous to be alive. That's spirituality. Anyway, that's what I'm doing here. We have other things to talk about, though. Let me go through the Bible text. There are not many of them. There are two in the, in the, I have handouts on it that summarizes all of this. All the important facts are on the handout, so uh, don't worry about taking notes unless there's something, unless that really helps you. But the important facts I'll give you, so you can take home with you on two sheets. Uh, there are these two texts. Uh, the one in Genesis, you know, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. The scriptures themselves, whenever they look back to Sodom, they never mention sex. Now, isn't that interesting? What they mention is people who were not welcoming, people who were not kind, people who had abundance and did not share. That is the sin of Sodom. Because these angels came and these people, not only did they not welcome them, they were going to rape them. 